Hello, my name is Christian Smith, and this is Talking Geopolitics from Geopolitical Futures. On this episode, Chairman George Friedman gives us his thoughts on the durability of America's alliances in the Pacific archipelago. Our Eurasia expert, Ekaterina Zolotova in Moscow, tells us what she's looking out for in the Belarusian hijacking crisis. But first, the diverging interests of Brazil and Argentina are threatening the existence of the South American trade bloc, Mucosa. Head of analysis and Latin America expert, Alison Federka, has been tracking this development for several years, and I spoke to her about what this means for the future of South American trade and what it tells us about trade for the post-COVID world. Alison, we're talking about South American trade today, uh, and I think the first thing that we need to really think about when we think about South American trade is Brazil, because Brazil is just by far and away the largest economy by a long way in South America. Um, can you just give us a bit of a background of, of what drives that economy? Sure. So for, for scope and size, right, it, it's a $1.8 trillion economy in 2019. Obviously, all of these figures worldwide changed in 2020, uh, but that made it four times bigger than Argentina. So just trying to give people some, some scope here in terms of thinking about just how big Brazil really is. Now, it's a country that uh, traditionally doesn't rely too much on exports. Uh, it relies about 12 to 50 percent of its GDP will come from exports depending on the year. So it has a lot of domestic consumption that it can use to drive its growth. And over the years, the economy has worked to industrialize, modernize, and try to get away a little bit from its, you know, the, the commodity syndrome that plagues so many South American countries in terms of being an exporter of, of raw materials to other countries. The thing that Brazil has been confronting in the most recent years is uh, a huge economic crisis, political crisis on top of that. Now it has COVID. The country needs to do several different uh, structural reforms in terms of government spending and how they use money, how they collect money, you name it. And what they have started to do when it comes to trade is realize, okay, we need to look outside of our own borders to be able to help try and grow this economy, to try to bring in more money. And the two best tools that they had available are trade and FDI. So obviously with the pandemic, uh, that has made trade very difficult and more competitive. Uh, FDI has also de decreased in terms of the pool of capital available worldwide, and that's shrunk. And so now people are also being more competitive in terms of where do they actually want to put their money and, and who are the most attractive candidates. And so now Brazil finds itself, uh, like many South American countries, still dealing with the pandemic and the implications that come with economic recovery, slow economic recovery, inflation worries and concerns, still needing to use and take advantage of its commodities for export because that that is actually rebounding right now. So Brazil can benefit from that, but still needing to think longer term of, OK, eventually we need to do these structural reforms. Eventually we need to kind of jumpstart things and trade and FDI still remain the most attractive tools available for them. Now, looking at Mercosur, compared to, I mean, can you, again, give us a bit of an explanation of, for those who don't know, of, of what that is as, as a sort of trade block? Would we say it's similar to the EU? Is it similar to NAFTA? Is it, is it none of the above? How does it work? So Mercosur is the Southern Common Market, and this entity came into being back in 1991. What it was intended to be and what it has evolved into are two very different things. The intent was to have it turn into something comparable to the EU, where not only there was a customs union, but there was a shared currency. There's free flow of people across borders. Uh, a lot of the traditional characteristics that you think about when you think of the e, the Eurozone uh, in particular. That never actually materialized. And so what we have... In, in Mercosur today is there's a, a common market. There is a customs union. There's a customs union within the bloc uh, because sometimes they have measures so, so countries can still protect themselves against each other as well as from external trade. Uh, but they've never really fully materialized into anything close to what we see in the Eurozone today. 
It's a little bit more than what NAFTA had originally conceived because NAFTA was just a free trade agreement. There was no ambitions of free movement of people or customs union or anything like that. Now, the reason it didn't materialize into the vision that the original authors of the agreement had is that essentially politics and, and domestic constraints got in the way. So the, the, this, the idea of starting Mercosur was very similar to what we had in Europe between France and Germany, where you had these two economic powers, because back then they were much on par with each other than they are now. And the idea was if we can link trade between these two countries, they have a shared common interest that's going to reduce the possibility or frequency of conflict. So that was the driving idea behind, you know, how the EU got started and also how Mercosur got started to a large extent. Over the years, however, um, the approaches of the different governments, the economic challenges that each country faced became markedly different. And while each country had their own economic crises, their solutions were very different. And a political ideology started to kind of get injected into the group. And so countries with domestic constraints wanted to have uh, you know, protectionist measures put in place or allowed for within the confinement of the agreement so that they could take care of their own industry, so that they could promote their own industry, so that they could maintain employment. And that didn't always necessarily work for other members of the group. And, and when we talk about this, we're primarily talking about Brazil and Argentina, namely because of their size. Uh, because of their size, they had the larger voices in this block. However, Uruguay and Paraguay also have a say. And when it comes to major decisions like free trade agreements, you actually need a unanimous decision by everyone in the bloc. And so that's also an obstacle that they've faced. And I think what we've obviously been seeing in the past few years is that uh, there's, there's a clear divergence of interest between Argentina and Brazil, both uh, going about their economic activities quite differently with different and uh, goals in mind. What's the state of play now? Because it's getting to the point, isn't it, where where the, the the block is essentially at the limits of what it may ever be capable of. Yes. Uh, so the state of play is Brazil's outgrown Mercosur. We wrote about this back in, in 2018, where basically the needs of the country cannot be met by the restrictions of the agreement. Now, last year, we saw Argentina say basically, hey, we recognize we're holding up free trade agreements for the bloc. We don't want to see the bloc dissolve. So for future free trade agreements, we're going to take a back seat. We aren't going to automatically participate in all of them, but we will finish out the free trade agreements that we've started. And then most recently, we actually saw Uruguay speak up and say, we need more flexibility. We can't keep using the constraints that we see in this group to limit our trade relations with other countries. So the interesting thing about following this particular trade blog is because it brings into light a lot of different topics that we are, are seeing worldwide with global trade. So we're seeing this idea, right, of a 25-year-old trade agreement that's never been updated, uh, bringing into question again, you know, do you update a free trade agreement the way they did with USMCA? Uh, if it's old, do you scrap it? Do you do some type of evolution where it stays where it is, but you you change it in such a way that it, it no longer takes a shape similar to the vision that it was conceived under? So that's a really uh, interesting thing to contemplate at a point in time where global trade has it, – it's in a process of being completely reshaped, and global trade relations are being questioned globally in terms of you know supply chain security, reliability – the price of goods going up, you know, what can you actually produce on your own uh, liability, as we saw with the Suez Canal. And this really makes every single country worldwide take a pause, think about what it is that they want from trade, what it is that they need from trade. And that's going to mark a point where they need to reevaluate the trade relationships that, that they do have. Um, and I think Mercosur gives us a really great example of a few different facets of a few different aspects uh, of this particular question in terms of reevaluating old agreements, what they want new look agreements to look like, where they maybe want to change their view instead of focusing so much on South America, trade partners from other parts of the world. And I think we're going to see a lot of other countries doing this uh, as economic fallout from the pandemic continues and all of these realignments are, are in flux does that pose a risk, therefore, do you think? Because obviously this, as you say, this, this this rethinking in the world is is happening, well, everywhere. 
Uh, and, and I suppose you could ask the question globally, does it pose a risk? But specifically in South America, I mean, as you said before, the block was uh, originally started to as a, as a sort of way of hopefully keeping the peace between Argentina and Brazil and, and what more widely within South America. Does it, does it therefore pose a more long-term threat if we walk away from these things? I think that's the main concern. On the economic front, it will op- getting rid of Mercosur would open things up. And that's the big question, I think, facing a lot of countries is do you evolve these agreements so that they can still serve your interests in the present day or do you get rid of them? Uh, because if you do get rid of them, then it becomes a question of, you know, how sound are agreements like this? How long will they last? Um, do we need to rewrite them all so that there's expiration dates or sunset clauses where you need to revisit them, as, as we've seen in the USMCA, where you, you can revisit these agreements on a regular basis? So that's a whole different way of thinking about trade because that also will affect all of your business decisions in the future as you plan things out. You need to have some type of predictability in, involved in that. In, in terms of security risks, um, I, I don't think in the specific case of Argentina and Brazil, that's something we need to be worried about. But I will say that it does point to this idea that all of these agreements, you know, 25, 30 years ago were built under the idea that, well, if there is trade, conflict will disappear because we're going to have so many uh, coinciding economic interests that we will have a shared incentive to avoid conflict. And I think what we're starting to see now is that in some ways, depending on the scenario, this connection between so many different players does not remove conflict. And when you see a situation as we saw in 2020, you can actually see more conflict arise because of all of these dependencies and countries realizing that they don't want to be that vulnerable to other players in the world. Well, more uncertainty after more uncertainty, I guess. Alison Faduka, thank you so much today. Ekaterina, you've been looking at the recent, uh, should we say, hijacking of the Ryanair flight above Belarus by uh, Belarusian President Lukashenko. Uh, it, it seems like quite the outrageous action, Ekaterina. But at the same time, Lukashenko would have obviously known the potential consequences of this. Why would he take the risk? To tell the truth, uh, to answer the question why Lukashenko decided to take this risk, and it's not so easy, uh, but it's easy to explain why this story is so important. Well, this story is very important for us because Belarus is the country that is sandwiched between Europe and Russia, and it seems uh, to be the last ally of Russia in the West, and it's, it also constitutes a solid buffer zone between Russian borders and NATO troops. Uh, therefore, this incident uh, that involves uh, several countries, especially the Europeans, may always attract special interest and special attention. Uh, so a plane of the Irish air, airline, Ryanair, was, uh, which was flying from Athens to Vilnius, urgently landed at Minsk airport because of the message about the explosive device. Uh, the plane was landed on the personal order of Alexander Lukashenko, the president of Belarus. So this is very interesting. The second interesting thing is that a uh, MiG-29 fighter was taken into the air to escort this uh, Ryan, Ryan Air plane. Uh, this report, I mean, the report about the explosive device or something like this, uh, turned out to be false. Uh, Roman uh, Protasevich, he was the founder of Next Telegram. It is opposition channel uh, and is recognized in, in, as extremist in Republic of Belarus. He was on the board of this plane and the criminal case was initiated against the journalist uh, on several issues, uh, including the organization of mass uh, riots uh, that we saw during the, <clears throat> during the autumn. Um, and the uh, People say that he could face up to 15 years in prison. So this situation looks very strange. There was a plane, there was 
potential a bomb. People were really scared. And at the same time, there was an, an oppositionist on this plane. So all of this uh, situation caused the criticism from the West. Uh, now the parliaments of eight countries, the United States, the UK, some European uh, countries like Germany and Ireland and Latvia, they announced that uh, they need to introduce the ban uh, over the flights over Belarus. And uh, also they are planning to ban Minsk from using the Interpol, and they also called for the release of the next founder, Roman Protasevich. Okay, I think it's, I think it's clear that that obviously there's there's going to be disagreement between between Belarusian authorities and and several Western countries, including the EU as well, over over what actually happened. But clearly, what the EU say happened is that is that this was this was a a hijacking by the Belarusian government. Because of that, the EU's response is obviously going to be very. Uh, important and it, it, it's a bit of a test, isn't it, for the EU in EU the EU's external power? What will the EU's response say about it? What we should we what should we be looking for with the EU? Well, right now the European Union is uh, discussing the measures against uh, Lukashenko's administration and uh, the, the country, and uh, as uh, I already mentioned, they are considering a ban on flights so through the territory of Belarus, or they consider the sanctions against some people. In my opinion, sanctions sound definitely more real uh, because fly, the flight ban may have an economic impact not only in on Belarus but also on European companies. Um, to tell the truth, there are not so many ways to fly from Europe to Russia. The fact is that the story about the next sanctions or about the ban of the territory, it's just uh, only the part of the really big one story. So... This case, we need to understand that this case is rather incomprehensible. There are more questions than answers. Uh, first, the news itself, it's very surprising. And some actions and reactions from both parties, from European and from Belarusian one, uh, not entirely logical. Uh, secondly, it is not known uh, what goal the Belarusian authorities really pursued when they were trying to land the plane. And um, it was not so clear if he wanted to remove all the competitors, including this oppositionist who was in the plane. Um, and it is not clear if uh, this case was an attempt to provoke the population for the new round of protests. And thirdly, we haven't heard anything about Russia. What was uh, Russian role in this um, action? Is this case of part of some bigger picture? Well, of course, we will hope that we will get all these answers very soon. But we need to remember that all of this, it's a very delicate question. Ekaterina Zolotova in Moscow, thank you very much. Talking Geopolitics is brought to you by Geopolitical Futures your source for geopolitical forecasting and analysis. America's friendships with countries like Japan, South Korea and the Philippines have really been more significant. Yet, in recent years, what seemed like infallible partnerships have been on shakier ground. But these links go back much farther and are based on much more than the US's modern struggle with China as Chairman George Friedman explained to me in this week's Fireside Chat. George, these alliances in the Pacific Archipelago, uh, Japan, South Korea, the Philippines, they all, relatively speaking, tend to be quite old alliances. In 2021, how important are they? Well, in 2021, given uh, the confrontation between the United States and China, they're enormously important. But I don't think it's correct to call them alliances. They're relationships that are very real, but they have different characteristics. Japan's relationship to the United States dates back to its defeat in World War II. South Korea is uh, the Korean War. The Philippines was a former colony of the United States. Uh, Philippines doesn't have a... a overriding agreement with the United States, but tends to cooperate. So when we look at this archipelago, you see history. 
You see Japan and the United States, South Korea and the Korean War, Philippines as a colony, the Netherlands, East Indies, now Indonesia, all of Vietnam, who is a friend of the United States relative to China. Uh, I mean, you really see history. So unlike NATO, which was crafted out of the remnants of the Second World War with very heterogeneous countries, this one comes together out of an old relationship, as with Australia. I mean, we have fought with Australians at our side through many wars, and it is almost unthinkable that we wouldn't be together on this one. I mean, that's really interesting because I think uh, one of the things that you can almost see the difference in some ways between the Five Eyes Alliance and then, of course, the intelligence sharing alliance that the US has been pushing for so long with, with South Korea and Japan is a certain difference there, though, in that sort of ancient level of of, of uh, friendship between those countries because I think what you often see is, is that those relationships with Australia and the UK and Canada and New Zealand tend to, tend to be much more open and, and, and more receptive than the ones with South Korea and Japan. Do you, do you think there's a difference there or do you think at the end of the day they're both pretty much the same? They're different, but that doesn't mean that they're neat, not deep. Our relationship with Japan is very deep, and cooperation is there a lot. Same with South Korea. We have troops stationed both Japan and South Korea. Um, you go down the line to Taiwan, again, a very close relationship. The Philippines, a complex relationship, but they're generally hostile to Chinese and don't bother us. So we go down it. Now, you, it's interesting that you talk to Five Eyes because then we have New Zealand, which is a member of the Five Eyes, which is has that history that Australia had with the United States, but it's always been much touchier, much uh, more uncomfortable. And right now they take a very different line toward China. So you, you have to – Five Eyes I think is true, but I think our relationship to Australia is very different from our relationship to um, – New Zealand, and then again, we probably are closer to the Japanese in many ways than we are to other countries. We're very close to Vietnam, which we we're at war with. So it's hard to make any generalizable statement, except one. They're all hostile to China. Well, let's talk about Japan for a second, then. Let's, let's kind of break these, break these uh, countries down. Japan, the alliance obviously goes back to the end of the Second World War, um, and, and for many years and for many reasons, uh, Japan's desire to develop its military was quite low. That's obviously changed over the last few decades. What role does the U.S. see Japan and what role does Japan see itself playing in this sort of counter-China, uh, I don't want to say alliance, but, but grouping? Well, on a broader level than just China, Japan has a fundamental problem, which is that it has no native natural resources. Uh, it doesn't have iron ore. It doesn't have bauxite. Uh, it doesn't have oil. It has to import all of it. And all that is, comes through waterways that can be challenged. And that was what led them into World War II with the United States, who were challenging their ability to access their raw materials. After World War II, they depended on the United States to guarantee them. And they still guarantee them. They have a navy, but the long road to the Persian Gulf through the Indian Ocean back to Japan, that they don't have the ability to control. And they look to the United States for that strategic guarantee. And that really drives that relationship with the United States. It predated the China rise. Uh, China rise contributed to it, but it's really about sea lane control, access to raw materials, and the United States. And, and what about the United States? I mean, I mean, how important does it see Japan? I mean, Japan's geographical location is obviously crucial, particularly when we're taking into account China. Um, but what role does it really want Japan to be playing? Because it's quite a, quite a balance that the U.S. wants Japan to play here, isn't it? Well, during the Cold War, Japan was critical because it rendered the Soviet port of Vladivostok unusable. There was no access to the high seas. And it was critical because otherwise 
in addition to challenging us in Europe, and to some extent in the Atlantic, the Soviets could challenge the United States uh, in the Pacific. Japan stopped that. We wanted Japan to rearm. I mean, the Japanese were the ones who didn't want to rearm. They liked the relationship they had with the United States. We were necessary to them. Uh, we were going to make certain that it had a viable economy. And they didn't want to pay the risk or the price of uh, rearming. The United States, by the 1950s, was pressing the Chinese, uh, the Japanese, I should say, the Japanese to rearm. So what the Japanese have done over a long haul is um, rearm, not quite to the point of global capability, but quite significantly. And part of that has to do with a distrust of the United States. Will the United States come to their aid if they're cut off from supplies? Well, it's far more comfortable to have some capability that the United States values that has to be preserved. And so the United States takes that role. So it's a careful game of the Japanese trying to do as little as possible, at the same time using its relationship with the United States, the dependency of the United States and its geographic position to get by with little and the U.S. pressing them hard that, look, don't count on us always. Go build your own system because we want a strong Japan. Japan is the third largest economy in the world. We, we want that strength. South Korea is one that, you know, and in large part because of the headline-grabbing nature of North Korea. South Korea is obviously an alliance that that seems quite important to the U.S., uh, but in saying that, that alliance has been a, a, you know, on a lot more shaky ground, shall we say, over the past few years. Is that alliance as important as it seems? The alliance has value. So long as we have Japan as well, it probably is not essential, but it creates an offensive base against China should we ever need it. Uh, there's been disputes. I mean, there is no alliance that doesn't have disputes going on in them. NATO was full of arguments, disputes, dissatisfaction with each other. I think we make a mistake when we judge the solidity of an alliance by the fact that there are disputes going on. We have to really take a look at the significance of those disputes and the consequences of the alliance breaking down for both sides. What pins the United States and South Korea together is that South Korea doesn't have a counter to China, doesn't have a counter to Japan, doesn't have a counter to North Korea. And therefore, under those circumstances, either it has a relationship with the United States or not. On the other hand, the United States looks at its geography, the way it boxes in some of Chinese ports, uh, sees North Korea as a manageable problem, and wants to make sure that Japan and South Korea work together, even though the South Koreans in particular despise them. It's it's interesting that, that South Korea and Japan clearly butt heads regularly, and, and their relationship goes warm and, and cold again regularly. How, how does that balance work? They need each other. Uh, alliances exist out of need, uh, not affection, for the most part. Uh, the Japanese occupied Korea and were brutal. Uh, they are still debating over the comfort women that the Japanese kidnapped and took there. Uh, this is a real history, as it, it would be for all of us. At the same time, they need each other. At this point, the threat to them is China. They need to have a strong counterweight to keep the Chinese in line. They can't afford to dispute these things. But every once in a while, these comfort women issues and related issues will come up. And there, you know, people have a very strange way of looking at an alliance. Just think of a marriage. The fact that you've had a terrific argument and broke to China or something doesn't mean you're getting divorced. Partly you need each other, partly you got fresh in the air, whatever. Alliances are the same way. Uh, you will have disputes. An intimate alliance will result in serious arguments, always. But ask the question, what do you need? What are you afraid of? What can the other guy do to you, do for you? 
Um, then you suddenly see the alliance in a different way. So the South Korean alliance, oh, yes, the United States has many disputes. Uh, Donald Trump wanted them to pay more for their troops, and the South Koreans didn't want to pay more for troops. And people took that as a rending of the alliance. There was no such thing. It was just, uh, I won't call it a lover's quarrel, but it was certainly an argument over money. And now the Philippines, you know, but I think when we think about the U.S. alliances in the, in the region, we, we definitely think of South Korea and Japan. But the Philippines is increasingly important in the region, isn't it? Why is that? Why is the Philippines so important? Well, we have to first understand China's nightmare. China is a trading partner. It's a trading country. It must have access to the sea. The U.S. Seventh Fleet has positioned troops that they are uh, ships, I should say, that they are afraid will blockade Chinese ports. Without that export capability, China's economy can't survive. China's terrified that this will happen. There's an other line, even if the U.S. doesn't mine their ports, where they can block them. The one that stretches from Japan, the Aleutian Islands, to the north, all the way down to the Straits of Malacca into the Indian Ocean, and to Australia. That line can blockade China. Now, China desperately needs to break that blockade line. And going to war is a bad option because it could lose. It understands how powerful the United States is, and war is not a very sensible option. So they look at the various countries around them. Who could they ally with? Who would want to ally with them that would allow them to open the seas so they could be blocked. Taiwan is one place that this, they could do this, if Taiwan rejoined them. Uh, Indonesia is unlikely to do it. The Philippines might, they fear, they feel. Uh, the Philippines have been lukewarm to hostile to the United States over the past decade. Uh, the Chinese look at them and say, well, we can give you things that the United States won't give you and you won't have to deal with them. But the Filipinos have generally said, no, thanks. They see the Chinese as uh, somebody you don't want to invite to dinner. They may stay. So why the Philippines is important is that it's a single place that if the Chinese held would make a full blockade impossible, they would have access to the sea sooner or later. So, the Philippines have been quite important, and they're enjoying their sense of importance. They're courted by the United States, and they're courted by the Chinese. And to this point, they've not budged, and I don't think they will. I think they understand that China is too close. The United States at least is far away, which is a benefit in the alliance. I want to finish with one question that talking about Taiwan raises that as well, but but so does this whole discussion, really, which is the question of red lines. And I think the issue for the US and all of these countries as well is where those red lines are. And I mean, if we look what happened recently with uh, with the Philippines and, and Scarborough Shoal and, and where the red lines around that potential artificial island near the Philippines is there, how how do these the US and, and its allies or friends in the region, how do they go about deciding where to draw the line with China's needling, with China's pushing in the region? It's China that has to draw this, the red line because it's the one under pressure. It's the weak power. I know that everybody thinks that China is the superpower, but it is locked into a very difficult situation. Their red line is by definition a bluff. Our red line is by definition a bluff. You draw draw red lines because you don't know if they cross it what you're really going to do at the moment. But you use those red lines to give a warning that you've got limits, okay? And to open up negotiations, which I think will happen eventually. But the problem that we really have with red lines is that are you really going to go to nuclear war? The United States used to say, if the Russians do this or that, we will go to nuclear war. But as Charles de Gaulle said, The United States is not going to exchange Chicago for Kiev. In other words, the United States can make any promise it wants. When it comes right down to it, what does it mean? It's going to do what's in its best interest. So red lines are a useful 
tool to try to shape the environment. But I don't think that many people take it seriously. We know if we blockade the Chinese, they're going to have to do something militarily. The Chinese know that if they try to bake out of uh, the line of nations, uh, we will probably do something about it. And the red line is what reality says it is. George, thanks very much. See you in a couple of weeks. Thank you very much. Thanks for listening to this episode of Talking Geopolitics. As always, we'll be back again in two weeks. But until then, take care and goodbye. You've been listening to Talking Geopolitics from the team at Geopolitical Futures. If you like what you've heard, be sure to subscribe to Talking Geopolitics wherever you get your podcasts. We'd love to hear your comments and questions. Go to geopoliticalfutures.com forward slash podcast to leave your feedback. That's geopoliticalfutures.com forward slash podcast.